Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm pleased to introduce uh, today's seminar speaker, uh, Martin, uh, Professor Martin Paul Bruner, who is an associate professor in the soft matter physics department at the Johannes Kepler University in Linz, Austria, where he also heads the soft electronics laboratory. He completed his master's degree and then his PhD in 2012. Um, in technical physics, also at Linz, and then after a postdoc at the University of Tokyo, he returned to Linz and joined the faculty in 2014. And Professor Paul Bruner's research includes interests include soft electronics and machines, photovoltaics, and film transistors, flexible and stretchable electronics, and electronic skin. Look forward to the talk. Thank you so much. Uh, thank, you for your thank you all for joining today's seminar. To the MSC department for actually inviting me over here. Well, it's a stretch to come from Europe. But it's a big pleasure, and I'd be happy to share our vision on soft electronics or why. So, why are we actually interested in making electronic or ionic devices soft? Well, if you look at yourself, see, you're in principle a very sophisticated, well, you definitely are a sophisticated soft machine. I don't know if I am one, but, I am <laughs> but in, in essence, all that makes you smart is soft. The starting with the brain, that's that's a muscle shell. And if you look at it mechanically, your muscles are soft actuators. What holds it together, however, is, is, is rigid, so the skeletal structure supports you. That's the truth for, for humans, it's not the truth for all the dwellers out there. You have like octopus and, and other marine creatures, or even not so sophisticated ones like snails and molluscus, that don't need hard components at all to perform quite some sophisticated tasks. So inspired by this new offense we found in nature, we thought, well, why not make our electronics also? And I have been introduced, but not all of you might know where Austria is. It's in Europe and definitely over the So uh, the city is famous for a cake, means a torte, and I took the liberty of bringing some. So if you have joined upstairs, maybe there is some left. So after the seminar, if you can get a bite still, I'd be happy to try to share that experience with you. It does also have a university, it's named after the famous astronomer Kepler. It doesn't have much to do with Kepler other than we have a famous book on his uh, integral calculus where he tried to figure out how to calculate the volume of a wine barrel because he felt cheated by the method of measuring the content of wine. <laughs> <laughs> he was right, people at that time took a stick and by the, by the distance, by the length the stick got wet, they decided on how much wine it was called. Obviously that would depend on the shape of the barrel, but without integral calculus. You can't figure out the of the problem. Well, you know, driven by these practical problems, he developed the method for this. We are all very practical, too, so, and that secret power, that's the department head where I have my PhD in 2012. He is, so to say, one of the pioneers in soft electronics in Europe. And then I reached out to Professor Carlton Mears Groups, that's the picture button to 12 to 13. It's Tokyo's country, if you have the chance to get to Tokyo, it's an amazing city. Go out there, it's about 600. Meters. I don't know how much that is in food or any other period. But anyways, it's pretty high, and you see the vast um, extension of that city. But it's also a nice place to do a postdoc. So the university is great. Um, for, uh, however, after after some time, I had to move back also for family reasons. But I was uh, I was lucky to to obtain habilitation within um, say two years after returning. That's a thing you need in Europe to become a professor. It's meaningless in the US. So so associate professor is a nice title. It's not the same as you would imagine to be an associate professor here. So there is basically no way out. So looking, that's absolutely great. What's the motivation for my research? Well, in a broader sense, uh, soft ionics is now really coming coming back with big scale. Uh, this work here on stretchable ionic hydrogels has been done by Christoph Kepling, who actually uh, studied with me in the same department. He went down to go to white size group you know, which is very interesting uh, materials. You can apply them for, for example, actuators. So if you apply a small voltage to this form of the capacitor, you will change the size quite tremendously. But this can be used on the small scale, but also for loudspeakers, but it can also be used on the large scale. For example, the harvesting of ocean waves, so harvesting energy from the motions of the ocean waves. So that's for sure a topic we Despite eventually what the new Trump administration says, we won't be able to move off the oil forever. <laughs> so we should look out for alternative sources of energy. You can do all kinds of fancy soft robots. Those are uh, soft elastomers that are inflated. 
dramatically and they can even be uh, covered with microfluidic channels to, to change their appearance of the arch, so to say. They allow degrees of freedom that are not possible with conventional arch rivers. We tried that in development kind of early on by thinking about power supplies for spectral electronics and in 2010 we developed it for compensatory spectral electronics. So more recently a lot of attention uh, was, was gathered around in terms of electronic skins and of course the seminal work of John Rogers who is now at Northwestern where they fabricated inorganic electronics in sort of epidermal batches so they can be stuck on their skin like a material in the form and they can measure how physiological and properties. We can go ahead and make um, organic electronic devices super clean that you can uh, then implant them into the brain. This is George Maliara's uh, work about the same time as we started with it. You can go ahead and make all soft, stretchy electrodes and attract uh, infusion channels. This is a step in the first where you can implant these devices to a rat that's been uh, severed in the spinal cord and so to some extent restore motion. So biomedical is of course a huge field. But you can also think about uh, robotics, consumer electronics, all of this has to be, or this, the future of this is to be flexible, soft, stretchable, lightweight, right? So this is from Wood's work as part of the uh, self-powered insects. And we also did some work on self-powered robots as well. So to sum this up, our idea is to create the electronics that's lightweight, and flexible, and stretchable, that can uh, conform to any object. And our speciality is to do this with low-cost methods in large area. So, this here is going to be more or less a summary about what I'm going to talk in the next, what's it, 40 minutes or so. So we created what's called imperceptible electronics. That's ultra thin on the order of microns, one to three microns, electronic foils that have a various, um, a various uh, functionalities starting from energy harvesting via organic solar cells. We can be displaced in terms of uh, polymer LEDs. These are all individual sensor nodes. If you want to scale up uh, sensor, sensory systems, you would need to think about how to address each and every pixel of that sensor, right? So what you do is usually you create active matrix of the new transistors that when you select the columns and rows, your pixels. You can make them out of organic materials and make active matrix arrays out of this. It's the same thing as basically in the back plane of the TV or in a, in a display, but in an ultra-flexible format. It goes on the skin and it doesn't distort you mechanically while you move, hence imperceptible. If you have thin film electronics, you can combine it with all kinds of um, interesting materials, like for example, shape memory polymers, and you get 3D deformable uh, electronics. You can think about designing plastic wraps, the same thing you know from the kitchen, but with a lot of new functionalities. If you have technology, you can think much further than just to imitate what um, human skin can do. You can introduce sensors, like for example, the sense for magnetic fields, you can call this a sixth sense in that sense. But it's, it's present in certain vertebrae, in certain birds, they can orientate along the magnetic field of the earth. We put um, kind of magnetic resistance sensors that, that think some of you might still know from hard drives. Of course, this is very nice to know, but they are sensitive to the presence of the magnetic field and change the resistance, so if you come close, you'll see that. Um, we, invent, we invested a lot of time developing further our concept for how to light solar power. And well, the last couple of years, a new absorber material based on aerospace crystals emerged. And you can really indeed work this into air stable devices that self power with little, little drones, so to say. We are a small university. We don't have huge resources. So you also have to think about how to make uh, your equipment at a low cost and make it available for everybody. And in fact, you can use Lego to build your own tensile testers. They're as good as the commercial ones, just not as strong, right? But if you're working in soft materials, you're talking about the low kilopass cost down to the kilopass cost. So these kind of materials can really be characterized quite efficiently with the devices that you make on your own. Of course, bioelectronics now, I'm sorry for the graphic images, but developing electronic circuitry that can, can go into the body and report vital signals, for example, from a rat, rat during operation, where you have a lot of, where you typically have small signals that would benefit from on-site amplification just to improve signal to noise. It's very challenging. Um, you can go and, and design temperature sensors that are very, very, very sensitive to some of the changes in temperature, and then you can go ahead and map the changes in the temperature on the land during inhaling. 
if you're not too comfortable with going directly into the body, you can stay outside and um, develop electronic textiles. That's a field that's now again booming. This year is an example of printable elastic conductors combined with a bit matrix readout. Or you introduce um, photonic skins that are, so to say, air stable organic LEDs, at least for a certain amount of time that you can really put on your skin and display information or measure signals. So I'm not going to go into detail on all of this, just view of them. So what's the challenge to create electronics like this? Well, we have to work with a very broad variety of different materials, and they differ in many properties, but one is, for example, the elastic organic modulus. So we work with materials that are all the way from liquids to gels, to so brain tissues this, this, this year, muscle tissue. These are elastomers that are already on the megapascal scale. So this is a water scale which mark is an order of magnitude. Rubbers are another 10 to 100 times harder poly polyimids or plastic foils. Though they are considered soft, they're actually not that soft. They're in the gigapascal range. They're not that far away from actual metals. But the hardest stuff you can find are diamond graphene, of course. Even this, uh, this materials, you can integrate in form factors that allow overall soft materials. And of course, we have a variety of deformation mechanisms at hand. We can do bending deformation, that's simple. We can do plastic non reversible deformation. We can do electroactive deformation, and of course, multi axial constraint. So, what's the key to make more or less thin film devices flexible and stretchable enough? Well, very obviously, it's the thickness of the substrate. So if you look at the textbook, now some of you might be familiar with organic solar cells, but they are usually depicted as substrate, a sort of transparent electrodes, then you have an absorber material that generates acetones and free carriers, and a metal electrode. Now if you draw that to scale, usually it's like this, even for flexible ones, you have a huge substrate, 125 micron, and then sub-1 micron solar cells. So the solar cell is about 0.4, percent of the total thickness and about one percent of the weight. Now obviously you can scale down the substrate. People haven't done it until we did it in 2012 to that extreme. So what we did is we used a commercial foil, 1.4 micron PET. Why commercial? Well, if it's commercial you can buy it, you can scale it up, that's good. And on this, we made a solar cell less than a micron and have a device that's all together less than two microns. So what's two microns? That's about the same as the thickness of the spider silk strand. And why am I putting this here? Well, the funny thing is we, we wrote this comparison in the paper and then all the news outlets says, researchers made, so, uh, made spider silk solar cell. <laughs> <laughs> that was kind of funny. It caught a lot of attention. We by no means made spider silk solar cell. <laughs> However, that's not a, a completely crazy idea. People went on to make actual spider silk solar cells because I guess what spider silk is an ideal bio-derived polymer that's biocompatible and that's what they call transients so when itself is sold. So by this, after you don't need your electronics anymore, you can just throw it away and it will be re, re put back into the natural cycle. So that's actually a good material if you want to work in the body or even just to dispose of the electronics. Our devices were rather simple. They had a transparent electrode made of a common field of PSS, of the high conductivity, and P3HD absorber, and metal back electrodes. So for the interested ones, these are very common materials for organic cells. So this is just in a nutshell. I know this is very simple, but it's always good to illustrate. If you have a substrate of a certain thickness H and you bend it into radius R, on this material you have a thin film electronic sitting here in red, then the strain induced into this electronic film epsilon is proportional to the thickness of the substrate. <coughs> but this is a simplification. In general case, it's more complex, but it illustrates what you can do by scaling just the substrate thickness. 1 by 4 micron gives a critical bending radius of less than 50 microns if you assume a fracture tolerance of 1 to 2%. That's true for a lot of metals and certainly true for polymers. You can go ahead and wrap a solar cell around the human hair. Well, don't ask me why you want to do that. It just illustrates that you can go crazy thin radii, like 35, 35 microns in the radius or 70 ish microns in diameter. It also resembles for those who are interested in the flag of Austria. It wasn't intended. <laughs> and they got scolded by the Germans. Oh, we could have done so as to look at the German flag. Well, why don't you do it? <laughs> uh, anyhow, this video here illustrates how lightweight electronics can be. And it's a floating active matrix transistor array next to a feather. 
I have a much funnier video from Japan for the interest of people. I will show it. It's not politically correct, so I didn't put it on stage since I videotaped. <laughs> but um, the fun thing is when we demonstrated how lightly you can make electronics. So uh, to, to sum this up, this is two microns thin foils for the whole sensor foil is about three grams per square meter. That's 20 times lighter than the office paper that's in front of you. It would indeed float through air, and I had a couple comments on the online media about this where people said, well, you know, irrespective of mass, objects should fall with the same acceleration. I said, well, that's great, you paid attention to the physics course, you just neglected air resistance. I mean, obviously that's true in vacuum. However, if you have uh, materials with low Reynolds numbers, and this is about 100, then they'd rather be swimming in, in, in the atmosphere like a fly and not really falling. So that's something you can take in <coughs> Electronics. Now that's the foil that we got from a nice German company for free. It's 10 centimeters wide and it's 10 kilometers long. So that's really long. It's a couple of miles. But the thumb is, don't ask me exactly why. This is the rest piece they gave us. So usually that's a meter long roll that do roll to roll processing for it, uh, on it. That was an extremely efficient gift because a couple of grad students, PhDs, postdocs worked on this and it's still there visible. Because in the lab you can just use it up. It's so long. It's about 10 times thinner than the kitchen wrap you use uh, back home to, to wrap your food. Now, PET is uh, not known, or PM is not known to be biodegradable, so you could say we are creating a lot of plastic garbage, though it's sophisticated, but it's still plastic. Luckily, colleagues from uh, Japan came to help us out here, so they found bacteria that actually metallize uh, polyethylene peroxides, and they found them, guess where, next uh, to plants that process PET bubbles. So nature stepped ahead and just evolved to eat this material. It's really fascinating. Mm -hmm. and food but maybe this will be the route to decrease the amount of plastic garbage. So how would you be working with this kind of foils? In the lab, it's OK to snap them on a, on a, on a, on a transient carrier. This is a reusable support with a, a PDMS, a an elastomer coating. And you have fundamental interaction between these two materials and the form a thin film, then you can do all the processing that you like. You can do vacuum evaporation, you can do spin rolls, you can do thermal annealing, you can do lithography all in one. And when you're done, you peel the electronics off, you have a finished device, and then you go back. So you can imagine that you can put this on your back and then do roll to roll processing. In fact, these foils are used to make a foil capacitors. Now, they are not the easiest material to work with. If you look at the microstructure, atomic force microscopy, you would. Um, find something like, well, if you would be in Europe, I would say this is the Austrian Alps. Uh, you'll find some equivalent mountains not so far from here. Um, the interesting part is that if you look at this, so, so this is a crazy structure, right? If you tell somebody to make a less than 100 nanometer thin film device on that surface and have it working, they would call you crazy. Luckily, I didn't know how the surface looked like when I started to work on this, so I just figured that out later. However, if you, if you really uh, think about it, and you do, for example, a 2 d fast Fourier transform, you will find that the roughness scale that you're dealing with here with starts at the order of 200 nanometers and higher. So this is not the same dimension as the small molecules, the organic molecules that we're working on. This is actually a couple orders of magnitude higher. So what would happen is you can deposit films just like snow on the mountains, and you get pretty much some form of coverage. So as long as the length scale of the roughness is not the same as the one of the molecules that you want to grow on top of it, you're actually not falling into the problems. So in essence, that's a crowded slide. We managed back in 2012 to make uh, solar cells, larger thin solar cells, about as efficient as the glass reference ones in the literature, and they were even good types. Why are we so interested in power per weight? So this is a, a new metric for solar power. Usually people look for the highest efficiency. However, for many, many, many applications like surface conforming foil, electronic textiles, artificial skins, robotics, flight, wherever um, the, the weight is a dominant influence, or remote power, even space exploration, and in fact, really, even uh, NASA approached us and was thinking about putting the solar cells to outer space. So wherever uh, weight or the cost per weight is dominant, this metric is more important. We took the, the hassle of, of listing all the solar cell technologies back in 2012, we started with panels, but of course you have extra stuff on there, so they're here. But the single uh, cells, 
We have the complex uh, six, of course, on gas, but if you make it on polymer oils, you can't really downscale them too much because you have high temperature processes. You can go all the way to uh, amorphous polysilicon <coughs> and the indium, indium gallium phosphide or thin silicon that you can make. They still wouldn't compare uh, to the ultra thin OPB, even though we have just about 4% efficiency. So altogether, we got 40 watts um, per square liter or 10 watts per gram power density. So if this number isn't telling you too much, what you do is you go on Wikipedia and let's skip the slide, but let's go down to the um, But uh, in a nutshell, you will find that this is about the, the power per rate that uh, you will have in a Boeing 777 jet engine without the fuel. So it's actually really large. Only for the space and the thrusters <coughs> would this be really large. So what are the mechanical aspects of thin film electronics? Uh, in, a, in a nutshell, um, you need to, uh, to think about where's the neutral mechanical plane in a multi-layer of substrate electronics and encapsulation. Well, the, uh, the neutral mechanical plane is, is that plane where compressive and tensile stresses um, cut out, they cancel each other out. Uh, you, you need the, the plane spread elastic modules and the layer thickness, and then you can calculate that if you design everything correctly, you do that another publication. Your actual device layer in white here is really protected from the harsh conditions on so the metric here that you need to, to optimize is the so-called flexural rigidity. You have people here, for example, young answer that knows all about wrinkling and associated um, and the theory behind it. That really, um, this formula is really that made back to the beginning of the 1900s, where German engineers um, designed shells for submarines, of course, war efforts. They were thinking about how to bend metal films. Now we are thinking about how to bend electronic foils and it really scales, it really comes down to this simple spinning law for reflection of rigidity that tells you how flexible the foil is. It goes uh, linear in the elastic modulus and uh, thickness q. So two micron thick electronic foils is orders of magnitude more flexible than thicker polymer foils, even than similarly thick steel, and it compares to actual silicon nanomembranes. So those are very successful, but this gives you the substrate to work. So we are really the whole concept really is. Now this is ideal to make things stretching, but it's really simple. What you do is you take a pre-stretched elastomer, you snap the foil on, put it there, and then you release it. So that's not important. We have in Austria, we have using instruments and people play with them really nicely. I, I'm unfortunately not able to play with them, so that's a big problem. But they can do electronic support. So that's the example for a solar cell. Here it's flat on the elastomer, then you relax it by 50%, and you have this crazy topology of poles and wrinkles. It's not really sinusoidal. If you look at it in the SCM, you'll see that you have valleys that are virtually uncompressed and then the sharp high aspect ratio wrinkles, which are called bridge wrinkles. Those form if you have a high level of crease during the elastic foundation and then you snap the hard end on top. Of course, you kind of do that in two dimensions and then you have a 2D deformable electrons. You can uh, look at the actual bending radius that you get in such a case. You can um, encapsulate these materials and then cut with a focused ion beam and then you outline here uh, the electronic foil, so that's the whole foil. You'll find that you have some sort of bending radii on the order of 5 microns, just to compare the carriers on the order of 70 microns. So this is really very extreme in terms of mechanical deformation that you can go with electronic foils. Interestingly enough, the solar cells work even under that extreme mechanical deformation, so these are IV cores and the different colors um, tell you different states of, of, of compression starting at the flat device and going down to 8% compression. Of course, this is not the current density, this is the direct current. This, as you take away area, the overall current output will go down. This black line here would, would be the case where you just geometrically cut parts of the solar cell. However, when you wrinkle the solar cell, um, the current or the power will scale above this simple geometrical cutting. This means this power plane wrinkles are sort of light tracking microstructures. So if you have a simple design and a cheap design for a solar cell, you can make it more efficient per unit area by introducing surface folds. I think we have some activity here. Like we saw with corrugated substrates. That's a simpler method. But it only works if you have really cheap solar cells. So the, the other factors like fill factor and VOC won't depend so much on the mechanical deformation in the device is not damage. If you have a solar cell, it's a small step to make uh, a light emitting diode, at least according to small step. 
All you theoretically have to change is the absorber layer if you put an emissive layer, for example, a, a orange or a red emitting bomber. And a lot of this work really was done by Matthew Wright, who is now publicly in the month. And with this, you can make the most flexible and most deformable OLEDs or polymer OLEDs out there. Yeah? You can start them on the polymer and then you can compress them. We have a little video. So that's a crude display, it has eight pixels. So this is not a 4K display as you can find in now from LG, for example. Trade is a little faster. But you can compress it to about half its size and it still keeps working. It's not perfect, but it does work. I have seen on the consumer electronics show this year, they showed um, one millimeter thick 4K 70 inch display. So this is very, this is going, this is our contribution to that field. Uh, the more advanced devices we did in collaboration with the guys in Tokyo. Of course, uh, the examples that I showed you up to now weren't all that they are stable. They had no um, barrier properties in terms of water and oxygen. You can, however, design one micron thick ish one micron thick substrates by using alternate layers of, for example, silicon nitrates, oxides, and polymers. Those would be a sufficiently large uh, water and oxygen permeation barrier. So you can make actually all this, a couple micron thick and put them on your face to indicate, as they say, emotion or digital information. Or at some point you can, you can have like in sci-fi movies your smartphone created on your phone to show you this calling you don't need a smartwatch, you have a smart skin. You can also think of medical uses of this, and one of the possibilities is pulse oximetry, so you can design a system that has two different colored LEDs. Actually, nice slide. You have two different colored LEDs and a photo detector, and by the amount of reflected light, depending on, on which wavelength you, you use to shine, uh, you'll see a difference in, in the absorption if your blood hemoglobin is oxygen rich or not. So this is a very new technology. However, it's not been shown to, to be made that flexible. So if you can do that on a large area, you can actually spread it over your leg and really mark the oxygen saturation in the blood, non-invasively, just by using of this. So the imperceptible sensor foil, now this is not a random for once, it's an actual photograph of a 12 by 12 pixel touch sensor on the human skin. This one is based on organic transistors and just for those who are not too familiar with organic transistors, it's a field effect transistor where you have a gate, a gate outside, interface layer, that's a surface and one layer, an organic semiconductor, ENT, that's very hard stable, and gate and grain contact. So this is a top view on a one micron foil, and the black dots here are actually spikes that stand out of the substrate. So this device, despite its roughness, is as good as on the planar silicon wafer. Um, the key to make this device is actually even work on a one micron foil is this oxide here. It's aluminum oxide and that's pretty really chemically grown. And the advantage of this method is you can actually form a dense oxide irrespective of the roughness of the substrate. And you can scale it just by ionization water. So this is a very precise method of putting a very dense oxide on a even extremely rough substrate. So this is again the illustration that we encapsulate this in a neutral mechanical thing. Now, one slide on history. When we worked on flexible electronics, people always called this a child of the 21st century. In fact, it's not true. People in the Westinghouse labs in the 1960s already made gold roll processing on plastic mylar foils. And this year, for those people who still know, is actually the rolls in an analog film camera. So they, they put this in an operator and then you just rotate the, the, the masks and then you can make uh, all kinds of circuits from multiplexers, high voltage. Uh, these are control circuits for simple planes all the way up to a, a phosphorant displays at a time where nobody gave anything about flexible electronics. So their, their efforts were cancelled because people at that time thought silicon would take over everything, even the large scale displays. Obviously they didn't, but at that time they were no. So you can't be too early with your research. I'm just they used fiber cadmium telluride and materials like this that are considered well toxic, you wouldn't want to put them on your skin. So our transistors characterization is a, a transfer torque. We get a mobility of around three centimeters squared per mole second. Uh, the silicon people would of course laugh about this for the organic, that's about what you could get in 2012, 13, and still people are now on the order of 10 centimeters per mole second. So rather low voltage operating transistors, a couple volts. This is important if you want to wear electronics, you certainly don't want to put 100 volts or more on your skin. 
fascinating part is about these devices, they're super flexible, they can be crumbled like a sheet of paper and actually work the same way before and after. You can work these devices into large area active matrices. Um, you use feed lines and board lines to address them, and then on top of it, you encapsulate them in a layer of party land, you build them holes in there, and you have an individual sensor for it on top of it. What you can do is you can go ahead and take your wedding ring and map where it's on your sensor foil. Why would you do that? Well, people use square objects and rectangular objects that was known to use the ring. It's more fun. It also tells you that you can indeed discriminate the position very well because wherever the metal touches the pixel, the current is on, wherever it doesn't, it's off. Now you can think ahead what to do with these materials and one suggestion out there is you put them, for example, in the model of an upper human jaw. I couldn't find a student that also didn't want to do it myself, so I did not model. And the idea behind this, uh, we have, unfortunately, people that are severely paralyzed from the neck downwards that can only communicate with their, we putting a piece of uh, object in your mouth and they would bite on it. So if you have a sensor for the covers the interior of your mouth at a certain resolution without distorting it, I think that would be a great advantage. But you can think of consumer electronics as well. You can actually integrate another level of functionality after you make, for example, your coffee maker or your steering wheel, which is coffee with an electronic foil. Now, uh, electronic plastic foils are not known to transport uh, temperature very well. However, if they are thin enough, they are quite good enough. And this is a one micron plastic with a conductor on, on Teflon support, while versus on copper heat sink. So if you pump current through it, this thing will not trail at a certain current density, whereas if you have a copper heat sink, you can transport 10 times more heat away, and you can actually heat a copper block to about A to C with a plastic electronic foil. It's actually quite surprising. You don't need to heat copper, you can actually measure temperature. You can measure temperature on circuit elements for probing up the fabrication or on frozen fish. Frozen fish is interesting. You especially, you especially want to know if the fish has been unfrozen before you eat it on the way to your supermarket, and you can actually do this for a long time. And the position of this simple PTC um, temperature, the temperature coefficient sensor is the same as the simple camera. So if you have the video electronics, RFID, and you can print, I think that's a neat way. You can also have a nice colleague in the class who has a temperature sensitive nose, and you put the, the temperature sensor on the nose, she brings cold and hot liquid, or vice versa, actually, and then you see the increase in body temperature. This is a cheaper version of what other people then later made to actually map the temperature distribution uh, on skin with exactly the same architecture. So temperature sensing, low cost. You can develop this into, into stick-on clusters for four way medical care. So our approach was to really use the sophistication of organic electronics to a larger extent by combining this pixel uh, selector with pseudocinus uh, inverters in the capacitors and the carbon nanotube infused uh, in, uh, hydrogel. And with this, you can indeed go ahead and measure um, the motions, uh, the, the, the electrical signals from a, from a rat's heart under the vivo <coughs> conditions, and then you can induce this gene, and then you will see a signal from this response and amplification is better than if you could read it out. Now, a very interesting topic that we started with UT Dallas was shape memory polymers together with one micron electronics. This material softens at body temperature. You can then have a flat sheet of transistor and then you can recover the shape by just heating it. For example, it was polymerized as a coil. Um, that's funny to have a 3D electronics, but you can think again, that's a graphic image. You can think about implantable electronics. Now, it's not absolutely trivial to implant one micron thin electronic foils because they're super flexible. So how would the surgeon put them actually into the body? What they use is a so-called shuttle that is a thicker polymer film and then this shuttle has to be retracted in this um, on a nice procedure. So if you can design your electronics to be stiff before or during insertion and then it will soften within the body due to the uptake of water and temperature, then it is actually an ideal case. People are working this into popular implants be equipped with organic transistors in the proof that they are actually able to survive implantation for a certain period of time. Now you can go the frugal way and do consumer electronics by combining off-the-shelf LED devices with elastomers, rigid enforcements, and one micron deep receptacle 
conductors. And I'm not zooming in here, so this is again a custom made to be a stretch in this laser cut. And you can expand the area of a stretchable display, so to say, by a factor of two and a half or more. And the beauty about these conductors is they don't change the resistance while you do that, so the lights will actually emit the same amount of light. And that is the famous um, Lego for a tensile tester. This is a grad student's work, so here is basically the testing part of it, the tensimeter, and you can use this uh, Lego Mindstorms to install the program and you can use a simple um, a force, uh, force torch you need to add, and then it's a caliper. And then you can actually build your device in the lab for less than $500 if you factor everything in their team development. You can download the plans and everything, the programs from our homepage, this whole open source, and you can design your own test of suspension. So a couple words about six sense magneto electronics. It turns out that you can actually do quite sensitive um, magnetic field sensors that um, are composed of alternating layers up to 50 or 100 of copper and copper. These devices are sensitive to the presence of magnetic fields. And you can see here that their sensitivity doesn't change if you count on them or bend them if you put them on your hands. This is a collaboration with our university, University of the New Commission of Energy. So this is one, skip the finger one. You can also put this on an inflatable membrane. For example, there is a magnet, this is a water-filled bottle, and here is the readout. So the idea behind this is you can put your magnetic field sensor on skin and implant just a little magnet, for example, on the hard wall, and you could from outside monitor what's going on in there without being actually too invasive for more than once. So what's next? Where, is this, where, where are we going to take these materials? One part of it are hydrogels, and hydrogels are fascinating materials. As I said, they're basically 90% or more water, but they can be still made tough in the form of interpenetrating networks. Now you can bind them instantly and strongly by using the correct adhesive emulsions to all kinds of materials. And I'm just skipping this and showing you a video. So this little um, things here are invertebral discs. These are 3D printed vertebras. And if you want, you can assemble your spinal cord, which is including hydrogels and, um, and invertebrate discs all together. This is a very talented student. She is super fast in doing this, but you know, can speed up the video. If you want to it. Yeah, speed. So this whole process can be done out of the glove box. It takes really not more than a second each. And you can bring a, a, large, a, a large diversity of materials together. These are hydrogels and polymers, but you can also add uh, tissue, you can add leather, you can add metal ceramics. And the whole thing is really tough. So a little bit higher level of sophistication, you can design um, electronic skins that, ex that consist of readout and communication power units together with a stretchable part that's on top of a hydrogel that's a temperature sensor. You program the little application that into communicates with your smartphone, you can wear these devices. The beauty about this, the hydrogel actually builds a perfect interface to the skin because it can transport away um, a sweat, for example. It can, you, you can think of delivering nutrition, you can think of delivering drugs while you melt through the reservoirs that contain the drugs. You can wear this for quite some time on the skin. It's not really so this is where we want to take hydrogels and for the last couple minutes, I want to show you a little bit of the activity on the periscites that you're doing. So this is a little plane that we made with hair stable periscites. Again, they're fabricated in one micron substrate. We can uh, do this methyl ammonium, uh, three, uh, lead three iodide based absorbers from solution in a one step, um, in a one step process. We can add an electron transport layer, and then most importantly, we can shield uh, the metal contact from the corrosive species that are very often liberated from this material if they are exposed to water by just introducing a chromium oxide into the layer. And this helps to increase the stability from seconds to days. This whole device is about 5.2 grams per square meter and it's about 12% efficient. Um, while this field is moving extremely fast, now the record is 24%, fiber not in plastic foils, 12%, fairly absolutely in plastic foils, and not so bad. With this, you get now about 23 watts per gram in specific power. Now, this is a new record, and this is enough to, to power a little uh, foil, a little uh, and the planes. I'll show you that later. But this compares 
uh, different architectures uh, of, of solar cells operated in the maximum power points, so that's where you can draw the most power out of the device. If you skip the chromium oxide interlayer, your device will be essentially dead to start with. But even on, on the foil device, where you don't add a special uh, water permeation barrier, you can operate this device continuously under one sun illumination for, for a couple of days. On glass, you have one uh, side that is fully protected from ingress of water, where you get a couple of well, one to two weeks. Now you can make a solar leaf with this if you want to. Well, you don't need to make a solar leaf, but however, the skeletal structure of a dry leaf is super sophisticated and very fine, so you can imagine placing the solar cells on, on the wings of artificial robots and power them. And just to show you how beautiful Austria can be in winter, it's a lot of snow. Nice sun. You can see here this is connected to a low transistor, uh, to a low resistor. If you turn the device into the sun, you have those high voltage levels in the dark. And um, you can work this into the whole panels and spray it with it. And I'll just show you this on the solar plant. So that plane has about five grams in total weight at the back here you have the solar panel. This is just a little electric motor. This is balsa wood and plastic foil, so that's it. It's a um, ten dollar plane, that's the engineer of the plane. It's not a perfect flight, I must admit, so we're not robotics engineers. However, I have to say this kind of planes are designed to fly in the room. They're not very tolerant to wind because they're too light. So this uh, is a uh, there are people that, that make sports out of this sort of sound. And um, well, this one is the first uh, uh, powered with, with, with parasite solar cells and it works out there. So our campus is not as nice, but it's also not too bad. And you can sometimes even take research out there and have some fun. I find this also encouraging for the students. There was a lot of fun to keep this video, even if you really want to there. <laughs> so, to put this into perspective, this is the first time the perovskite solar cells of that kind actually were taken outside the lab, outside the lab. So I think that was a nice demonstration of stability. Where are we going to go with this? Um, so, not only solar cells, but uh, light emitting diodes made from perovskites are interesting because, as you can see here in the emission spectrum, they have a very narrow band emission. And for this, you can, for example, size tune. Um, the nanocrystals by designing nanoporous templates and integrate this in LEDs. So this is something that we are interested in, not just synthesizing nanoparticles, but adding them uh, as uh, another layer of dimensionality and control by designing a nanoporous matrix where you can incorporate emitting and electrically addressable uh, perovskite nanoparticles and just with one confinement effect, you can see quite some shifts already from now to the confined state for three different colors for three different materials. I just said exactly on time. Let me thank the, the three big groups who were involved in all the present, you know, the work that I was about to present today. This is Somaya Sekitani group. It's not existing in that configuration anymore. Sekitani Sensei is now a professor at Osaka University, Somaya Sensei is still in Tokyo. Um, this is the Linz Institute of Organic Solar Cells with Professor Sergei Savicivici, especially Harry Kravatsky and uh, Matthew Wright, who is now at the University of Vermont. It's on the side. I owe a lot of thanks for a lot of work. And uh, that's the soft matter physics group, uh, Secret Bauer, a couple of the most talented students I have pleasure of working with. Of course, the funding and uh, you for your kind attention. based on mechanical influence and de degradation based on, on environmental influence. We didn't do the studies in the glove box. So we, we can do well, 20 to 100 compression cycles to about 50% and then it would, it would degrade. Of course, you need to be careful. Um, we are not particularly controlling the formation of those faults and wrinkles. And if you get the high aspect ratios, you have enormous um, fending radiate and that could actually crack your metal. You, you can, however, control the formation of wrinkles if you decide the anchoring points of the last term of the, of the thing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. 
questions. Yes. Uh, the first question is, uh, how do you deposit your materials on the tin or the PET? Do you uh, evaporate or do you spin coat the active layers? Number one. Okay. Uh, number two, um, the way you uh, measure your strain is when you pre-compress the substrate and then you take it from there. As in the compressed link is your L1. And then when you go to a uh, stretched link, that's your L2. In reality, this is hard to pre-compress every single thing you put OPVs on. So have you looked into actually true strain, meaning you look, you look at the PET unstrained and not compressed, and you speak with the active layer and see how how you know how forgiving they are mechanically. So to answer your first question, we do various processing steps. We do solution process when we are spin coating, but we do also vacuum evaporations so and metallization layers are evaporated. The polymer blends are solution process. Yeah, I understand, of course, but I mean, is it challenging to spin a coat on a one micron substrate? Do you tape it to a yes, of rigid course. substrate? Yes, of course. This is what I showed in one of the slides. We have this um, either glass slides or thicker polymers that are able to be and then it's all good years. Okay. Um, that's quite a nice method. So we don't spin coat in the compressed state. Right? This is causing troubles on its own because the conformal coating of such corrugated substrates is not that easy. I mean, we have experts actually here to, to work on this. Um, the definition of, of the strain, so we like both. I, I can go from the original length and then compress it. However, Psychologically, they give small numbers. So people like to have tensile strains. And for this, you would have to go from the most compressed strains, just for calculations. Uh, state, just for calculations. Uh, scientifically, there is no difference. It doesn't matter. You cannot stretch these materials much over their flat state. It's not possible. Then you would fracture the devices. But well, this is my point. We've stretched PQCPCBM 100% on original and length without fracturing. Yes, this you can do. And this is becoming more and more popular the last couple of years. It's not possible for, for example, this perovskite absorbers. You can design polymers to be intrinsically stretchable. You can even now design semiconductors to be intrinsically stretchable. I think it was mentioned here from Shannon Bauch a couple of weeks ago. Concepts of intrinsically stretchable uh, OPVs include using um, liquid metals as top electrodes. It's all there. So I'm happy to combine all of this. For the more sophisticated devices, it turned out to be so far not possible to make them intrinsically stretchable. For example, oxide layers are super difficult to extend to more than one percent. But combining intrinsical stretchability and mechanical patterning methods, I think that's, that's very good. Thing. Thank you. Thank you for a great talk. Thank you so much. Okay. Um, and this is so very interesting. Um, uh, I have a question about one trivial problem, which, however, turns out to be a challenge for such devices, which is how do you feel really reliably connect wires and interface them? That is really challenging. Uh, kind of what, is, what, what are your approaches to that? Do you so mention liquid metal maybe or not? Liquid metal is good. What we are using now are also indium based soldering pastes, so materials where you can work in the reflow process at maybe 60, 70. Centigrade. This is what we use, for example, for the on skin uh, demonstrator to connect the one micron foil to the actual real electronics. So we, we just we are screen print and apply a low temperature soldering paste. So that's maybe one way. People use anisotropic conducting pastes. It's very successful to combine this with the stripe on it and even mess it at certain points. The long term mechanical reliability is uh, very much a a lot of research is going on in that direction, however, people have hard times publishing it because it means you have to do millions of cycles. It's very industry near research. I know a couple of people back home in Europe who are focusing on this. They're having a hard time publishing their work. So it's always this trade off, you know. So some of your work should be a little bit more showy, and the other work should be a little, a little bit more into the detail. I, I showed you more the fancy stuff and skip the details. So <laughs> uh, what do you see as a grand challenge in extracting uh, the It's a grand challenge. Well, the field is very much moving into biomimetic um, devices, implantable devices. That's a huge challenge. So, what, what all the materials we have now don't survive very long in the fields. So, this is actually. One of the greatest challenges. 
to design, to engineer materials, to long-term stable computer system, the biofouling, and all these kinds of layers that we add on top of the material of the interface once you bring it inside the body. This is a great challenge. I mean, the, the, the frugal approach to this is to design transient devices, right? So you put them in there for a certain period of time and then they dissolve and you don't care. But that's good. So the chronic, the chronic implantation is super challenging. In terms of, uh, of stretchable electronics, if you think of going to the consumer market, you still need to simplify things a lot. Because these foils would be easy to be damaged with sharp <coughs> objects. So how would you teach a customer not to cut your electronic foil? I think that's a big challenge. The size of the, the, the stability of the good. Very tight. Um, can you go into a little bit more detail about the hydrogen fluid? Um, this is an unpublished. Uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'd be happy to share it with you in private. <laughs> That's a very, very, very active field. The advantage of nanocrystals made from these materials is, as I said earlier, narrowband emitters. You can go, and that's challenging, but you would want to make lasers and single photon sources out of these materials. Uh, Try to be fast of people are working on it. But I think it's going to be times to be in the soft electronics field at the moment. There's really new developments left and right. Sorry. I think it's very exciting you were showing the surface of the foil and that you can put like that it still works you can have such a crazy rough surface and then uh, put like snow on it as you said um, I was wondering you were showing an FFT uh, image uh, I was surprised um, because I, I expected it to be like symmetrical but I think it looked asymmetric in, in the first part of the talk I was just wondering if you could explain just what it means uh, what the shape means and then I also have another question, which is, do you think if you had seen that surface before, because you were mentioning that you, you didn't know that, do you think that would have been like demotivating to you? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so people call me crazy because especially when I started working on, on, on these foils, there was this idea that organic electronics will only work if you have super flat surfaces. This might be true for some materials, pentacin was notorious condition for the rough. Substrates, but it's being largely replaced now. So sometimes it's good not to know too much, just to try. Especially when people tell you this is not going to work. Right? So I went to the lab in Tokyo and I said, "Well, I have this, this, this neat technique of growing anodic oxides in plastic films. We work it into some flash memories. We can actually use it for 
you're doing. So, okay, here's a bunch of substrates. And that's a really thin one. Don't use this. It won't work. Oh, that's interesting. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to use exactly that one. Well, it may have not worked, but I was lucky enough it, it did, so don't be too discouraged. Uh, to be honest, the, the asymmetry in here, not that you noticed it, I, I didn't make up my mind too much about the, the asymmetry. It may be that these things are just irregularly shaped. So I know why, why this is so rough. They actually put on purpose um, filler particles in there during the extrusion process uh, because the roughness holds an addition of the influence. So this actually drastically improves the adhesion of the Because people use these foils um, metalized with aluminum on one side and you roll them up and then you have foil across it. So a lot of engineering already went into these foils. They're actually quite tough, so they're not easy to break, un unless they have a wash. So that's something that we are also interested in. You should, you, you may think about the self-healing mechanisms in this, in this hydro charles polymers, elastomers, and that's a big <coughs> community, so reversible bonds, ionic hydrogen uh, bonds. We, we are also working on this. Were you able to do any trials on the, the upper mouth uh, sensor? Does that seem like the dexterity from your tongue is it more dexterous than whatever the bite method was before? Or? Um, so I would have loved to develop this further. I had to leave Tokyo before I was able to do so. But we did some stability tests. So you can dip these transistors into salt water. It's <coughs> very physiological liquid. They last for a couple of weeks. That's good. Um, the, the circuit that I have shown you here is a little too complex for this. You would, need, you would want to design less sensor nodes just so you don't overlap them by the What you can also do is you can, as Jan, uh, as George just said, excellent um, you can use a Kirigami patterning to, to really conformally code um, more complex shapes. So you design your circuit and you can cut out certain parts and then you have more conformal coding. It would be exciting to, to work for you know, this given uh, resources. So in links, we are not doing a lot of uh, TMT work just because we don't have technical for the real <coughs>
this chair around the surface. And so while that part worked, the metal wasn't as conductive anymore because it, it kind of flaked. And so that wasn't, it, the build wasn't you know, it was uniform enough to be conductive. So we yeah. Um, so in, in our system, we, we've been using this one now, but it is not too much price. I don't know why I don't have any suggestions. So I don't think it's going to be quite well. Is it going to be quite well? Are you guys going to just put some ways to do that? Yeah, that's all. Yeah, I have a menu, and then shortly I have enough choices. 